Hello and welcome to another episode of Spotlight Sessions. My name is Ilan Fisher, the host, and today I'm really excited to be having a conversation with Susan Stover. Susan is the CEO of Victoria's Victory Foundation. Victoria's Victory is a really awesome foundation based on the personal story of Victoria Arlen. Victoria is currently an ESPN host on SportsCenter, former Paralympian, and has a really, really awesome story. So. Welcome to the show, Susan. And Thank of, you. I, we would love to hear a little bit more of the story of Victoria's Victory and how you got involved as well. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, Victoria's Victory is named and was founded by Victoria Arlen, and it's named after her amazing victory. So at age 11, out of the blue, she was a healthy young girl, and her family had just returned from a trip uh, from Disney World, and all of a sudden she became struck um, with illness that started to literally shut down her body, and all of a sudden she was in a vegetative state, and it happened um, rather quickly, and it was very uh, difficult, so she went into a vegetative state. Actually, she became what's known as locked in, in that she could hear everything that was going on, but no one knew that she could hear, and she wow. did not have her normal functions. And she went through numerous misdiagnoses, and she also listened to many doctors tell her family, there's nothing we can do for your daughter. You might as well just give up. And she was surrounded by a family that was filled with hope and said, nope, we're not giving up. So they truly built a hospital room in their front living room and cared for her. And she went in and out of hospitals for um, years, having myclonic seizures. And again, she was non-communicative. She was unable to use her hands, her legs, etc. cetera. Eventually, um, she, you know, to kind of just summarize really quickly, um, she blinked one day or she had eye movement. And her mother said, if you're in there, and you know what I'm saying, blink. And she did. Wow. And from that point, she started to be able to kind of claw her way back. Um, and I say claw her way back because I don't think that people understand the difficulty that someone living with a disability has. Victoria had to learn how to eat, speak, sit, walk, everything. And so she came out of this um, state of being locked in and was in a wheelchair now because it turned out that she had two rare neurological diseases that traveled down her um, spinal cord for, wow. for kind of the easiest way to explain it. And they actually, the fact that she had two simultaneously, they kind of battled each other, but unfortunately it left her paralyzed. So from the waist down, um, due to the damage to her spinal cord, she cannot feel her legs down. So she was in a wheelchair for 10 years, and as you mentioned, she became a Paralympian. She broke numerous world records swimming. She um, won gold. She won silver. And then she was nominated for um, Paralympian Athlete of the Year, went out to L.A. to the ESPY Awards, and that's how wow. she got connected with ESPN. She's such a dynamic force. Her personality is so amazing that they said, we'd love to hire you to do some special um, reporting for us. So she started doing Paralympic Games. She started doing X Games, different assignments, all while still in her wheelchair. Unbeknownst to them, she was training vigorously to learn how to walk. And um, she was going through a, a training program through Project Walk which is all activity-based training. Uh, the belief is, and we are big believers in this, it's, it's what our mission is about, is that a body in motion stays in motion. You know, so many people hear paralysis and they think, okay, well, just forget about, put that person mm -hmm. in a chair. No, we believe you find a different way to send a message from the brain down to the body and fire up muscles, fire up neurons, fire it all up and and you can do amazing things. So Victoria, after being in her wheelchair for 10 years, took her first steps. And she now walks independently. However, there are days that her body tells her, mm, you're not going to walk. One of the things that I think for Victoria herself, um, and 
Um, people don't realize if they just look at her on ESPN at Sports Center, she looks a hundred percent healthy, but she still has her own physical and mental challenges that come with her disabilities. But the reason why she was so determined to start the Korea's Victory Foundation is throughout her journey, she saw numerous people, whether they were in the hospital or in their own um, training recovery journey, they didn't have the support that she had. I mean, her parents literally were willing to mortgage the house for her, you know, set up a hospital with not everybody had that. And she said, I want to be the resource for these people to provide them the things that they need for their everyday lives. And that's where Victoria's Victory is a little bit different than um, a lot of other um, nonprofits in this space um, in terms of mobility challenges and paralysis is that we focus on the everyday needs of someone. Um, when you are struck with a disability, whether it's um, a child at birth or your life changing in the blink of an eye from an accident, there's no manual to help you. And we want to help provide resources for everyday needs. And we say that we are an organization that is about quality of life every day. So we don't focus, although we absolutely believe research is so important and we want to find, you know, obviously a cure for spinal cord injury as well. We really try and put our funding, our, ed our advocacy, our awareness, all about the everyday needs of somebody that's living with a mobility challenge, whether it is paralysis, um, full paralysis, or it could be somebody that's an ambulatory wheelchair user, meaning they use it sometimes, they don't need it other times. They still have challenges. Um, recently, you know, we posted on our Instagram page, it was the first snow in New England where we're based, and we said, the snow is beautiful, however, let's remember to shovel your sidewalks, plow out the handicapped spots. Think about people who have different challenges because that's one of the things they're trying to do is things that you wouldn't think about. Getting out of your car and getting to your office probably takes you two to three minutes at most. Whereas for somebody that may have a mobility challenge and has to transfer out of their vehicle into a wheelchair or onto crutches, it could take them 15, 20 minutes. So what obstacles can we make other people aware of that they could help remove for people. So that's kind of also within our mission. We say that we are here to help people achieve their own personal victory. So that's a lot jammed <laughs> into like one really long sentence. <laughs> you can no, see I'm and, very and, passionate and, about it. <laughs> and her, Victoria's work is amazing and the legacy is incredible. I'd love to know a little bit more on what are the type of victories that you've had at Victoria's Victory? Because you speak about that day to day, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about those those personal stories and and how your foundation has helped enable those. Absolutely. So when we started in August of 2017, which means we're coming on our five year mark, and we're so excited wow. because honestly, we were only two years old when the pandemic hit, and for a nonprofit. That's really frightening. And we are 100% um, donor dependent, whether it's mm -hmm. sponsorships, whether it's corporations. So that became a very frightening time. But we did a really great job in building our foundation um, from the start. So, you know, um, our leader, our uh, chair of our, the board, Jacqueline Arlen, who's actually Victoria's mother, always says to us, you know, Start as you plan to continue. And it's such a great mindset because it really makes sure everything's in place so that I you can that. just move forward. It really is great advice that you can apply to anything. And you'll, you'll hear it in your head every once in a while that mm, that really does work. But what we came out of the gates doing was um, we started what we call the Victory Scholarship Program. And within the Victory Program itself, um, as I mentioned, we have education and awareness, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that. But then also the Victory Scholarship Program 
we started granting within eight months of being um, an organization. And truthfully, we came out of the gates and we're like, give anybody everything and we want to help everyone. And then we realized along the way that obviously there needed to be a little bit more structure. So we have developed a program where we grant scholarships now twice a year and they um, are the recipients fill out applications and um, they tell us their story. The more a recipient can give us the background of why they need the services they're requesting, the more we can understand how we can help them. Because in addition to maybe giving them a monetary scholarship, sometimes it's a partnership. We may know of a facility in the area that they live, or we may have a relationship with a vendor that works mm -hmm. on vehicles that we can help them in a different way that they thought of. So the more that somebody that's applying for a scholarship tells us, the more that we can, as a committee, come together and decide how we can help them best. And so we focus on four areas of funding. One is the recovery training sessions. So that could be anything, uh, someone that's recovering from a stroke wants to learn to use their arm again. Somebody that's fully paralyzed, again, people just write them off. We don't. Get those arms moving. Get them stretched out. Keep their legs going. Get those muscles being fired up on a regular basis. It could be somebody that is walking currently with crutches, but they want to walk completely independently. So recovery training has um, really one big umbrella of what it can service. Um, we also look at mobility equipment. And mobility equipment is so important because people think a wheelchair. Oh, it's just a wheelchair. No, all of us are shaped differently. We're all different heights. We're all Absolutely. different weights. It's, it's like your clothes. It needs to fit you properly to do its job. And mobility equipment might mean a standard for somebody so that they don't have to be in their wheelchair all day because that can have its own complication. Mobility equipment can also be a monoski to get somebody back up on a mountain, to get them outside enjoying and being a part of the community that they were prior to maybe an accident or a diagnosis. So that's another area of funding. We also do in-home care. Shockingly, many times people are considered too healthy to need in-home care that's covered by their insurance. And the in-home care could be anything from transferring someone out of their bed into their wheelchair to get them dressed, get them showered, get them off to their day at work. Or it could be helping them with tasks such as eating, anything like that. So in-home care is obviously very important. And then the fourth area of funding is the home and vehicle modifications. So that might be putting a ramp onto somebody's house or installing um, a walk-in shower versus something with a bathtub so that they can get in and get to mm -hmm. whatever that is. Or it could be installing um, hand controls for someone. For example, one of our very first victories was actually giving a young boy who was turning 16 hand controls for his car so he could drive just like his friends. Excuse me as I cough for a second. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Talking Bless you. <laughs> but that's a type of vehicle modification. So to answer your question, we have actually, um, in the very beginning, we had a couple of people donate vans, so we were able to donate vans. We actually don't do van donations anymore, but those were two victories that were amazing. We do driving lessons for people so that they Love can that. learn, right? And it's it like so that they can get back to work or get to their training recovery session. But all of these things cost money and above and beyond what groceries cost or, you know, just all of the other equipment that somebody can need. So if we can help take something off someone's plate, we, in our short, less than five years, have given close to $500,000 in scholarships. Wow. We are based in New Hampshire, in New England, but we do service the whole country. So we have 
already funded in, I believe it's 26 states now. Um, and we have seen some major victories. We had a young woman who had an accident in Hawaii, and she was told she would never walk again. She was told she'd never move from her shoulders below. She has gone from being in a wheelchair to now she is taking steps independently. Um, amazing. And wow. we've been a part of that journey watching her. And um, we had funded recovery training for her. We, um, we have also um, seen children that have gotten the ability to get a piece of mobility equipment that allows them to do activities with their friends and family. So inclusivity is so important for every person. You know, I feel like we're in a generation where we talk so much about inclusivity, but nobody really talks about it for people with disabilities, unfortunately. And it's often the forgotten community, and we are trying to change that mentality so that they are not the forgotten community, and they are mm -hmm. part of these conversations about inclusivity. 100% and I know people speak a lot about DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, but yes. it should 100% be DEIA. 100% and that's, that is something that we are super passionate about. One of the ways that we're doing that is we're actually starting some community service programs with local high schools to have them work on events with us from the planning mm -hmm. stages all the way to execution. Unfortunately, awesome. we have not done an in-person fundraising event in two years. We are planning to do it in October of 2022. And so we're working with a school program so that these kids are, like I said, thinking about everything from the planning materials of how to market an event, but also how to create and design an event that's 100% accessible, that is 100% sensory adaptive, um, things mm -hmm. that they would not normally think about. We've brought them out to the space and said, okay, what do you think we need to think about here? If our guests are attending in wheelchairs, if our guests are attending with crutches, if we have somebody that has a traumatic brain injury, they are probably going to need a quiet area. All of these things that these kids may not think about. And so this is a really exciting program that we're working on right now. And, and it's so awesome because if you think about it, once they go and go through that program, not only is it a win for your community who are getting these essential services, but also f think about all the participants who are going to be taking place in it. When they graduate high school and go to college, they're going to think, hey, maybe that place should have a ramp or maybe that website needs to be accessible. Or what about my classmate? How can I best accommodate to him, her? Or otherwise. And that's and our it's... goal, exactly what you're saying, because we want them to start thinking about outside of, and think about it, when you were a teenager, you would never, and there's so many adults, and it's nobody's fault, but we just want this to become... It's education, of, completely. Exactly, somebody's regular vernacular in how their brain thinks about things. Like I always think think of myself as somebody who grew up, you know, and very, um, I think of myself as somebody very forward thinking growing up in metropolitan cities around the world, but never really thought that deeply about the questions of accessibility when I, when I was younger. Right. And, and, and program, pro, a program like this could have changed that, that thought process even, even quicker. You know? That's why we went into a high school because we said, if we can get them to start thinking about these things now. Think about the change makers, the social change theories that they can be a part of mm -hmm. in the future. This is something, like you said, they can go on to university and they can um, apply it to anything that they're studying, anywhere that they walk into. And in the area that we actually live in, there's a lot of grandfathering that happens. And what's been really interesting in terms of education with local business owners is They've said, oh, my gosh, I can't adapt the space I'm in because the building owner won't let me. It's a historic building, etc. cetera. Yeah. But we have business owners that have come up with adaptive shopping programs. Um, simply wow. after hearing the needs of the community that we serve, they've said, well, what can we do? And they, a lot of great things actually came out of the pandemic in terms of curbside groceries, Instacart, all of these things. Yeah. Somebody can have something delivered. And a lot of business owners 
to have realized, wait a minute, these are things that we should have been applying all along to make the community accessible. And so that's another piece of what we're doing and some of the victories that I feel that we're having because we're getting people to think about things differently. So it's funny because some people think victories only happen if they're um, attached to a monetary achievement. And I don't. I think the victories come in the education and making awareness for everybody and the business owners. And now they're going to have a conversation with their friend who's in construction. And like you said, hey, is there a ramp that's going to be there? Or is there a push button for this door? All of that. And, and, and I love that because it, I, it's what I think of as the snowball effect. When you tell somebody and educate them about something and it's impactful to them, it's going to create the next person and the next person and the next person in that chain. And especially with what you're doing with high schools, I absolutely love that idea because they're taking so much impact from it. Your community is taking so much impact from it. And at the end, everyone gets to a better society. Yeah. And that kind of leads me to my next question, Susan, because you've spent a lot of time working in nonprofits and specifically in Victoria's Victory. What does accessibility mean to you from a personal standpoint? For me, accessibility means that anyone has access to anything and it means that there are no barriers and again i go back to i feel like we're living in times where we're constantly talking about barriers being brought down but i don't believe that that conversation happens enough for the disabled community and so accessibility in my mind will be truly achieved when Disabled is as part of the conversation mm -hmm. at the forefront. Anything that's being done, you know, I, I'm also in the fitness industry. And to me, anyone should be able to come into any class and be able to take it because there should be modifications that are just readily available. Not because we had to go out of our way, but just because that's how you design a program. So in my mind, any program should be designed, any type of um, event, anything should be accessible to anyone, no matter what their circumstances are. And I think that we're getting there just in the fact that you and I can have these conversations through a screen, you know, I mean, we're not actually sitting in the studio together, but we're getting to connect and, and learn from each other. I think that we're on a good trajectory forward. Um, and, and we're actually about to develop a whole caregiver program that will be done through the screen for a while so that we can reach out because again it's finding the needs of somebody within this community and the caregivers are in this community and they need access to resources as well and so that's a whole nother form of accessibility that we find is something that we need to be able to open the gates to everybody for. And, and I love that answer. And when you were saying that, I was thinking of something that somebody told me a couple of weeks ago, and they basically said, think about how many inventions there have been that were made for the disability community that have actually helped everybody. Yes. Oh and, and when you were saying the fact that we're having this conversation by screen, the fact that we're now working over Zoom or, or right now I'm using this platform called Riverside, and it means I can connect with people around the world and have access to them. Exactly. And that's just amazing. Well, um, a perfect example of that, are, are you familiar with the Hoyts? I am not. Okay, so this is a, um, or was a father and son running team. And um, if you Google anything about the Boston Marathon, basically um, the son was disabled and he told his dad he wanted to participate in a marathon father was not a runner and he said okay I'll figure this out so he started developing on his own the perfect type of mechanism and stroller if you will to be able to run and push his son most of the running strollers that are out there now were part of his design started as his design so as you said like here is an invention that started for somebody that was disabled, that has become mainstream, that so many people, so many running parents can thank the Hoyts for because he 
was innovative enough to find a way to do it. And, and then this amazing thing, and that's just a whole nother story because it's amazing. So I'm a I'm, hundred I'm percent going to be checking this out after, okay, after this. Good. And, and Susan, really just the last question yes. that I have for you is something about your like local community. If you had a message to business owners, what would that message be to cater better for your community? Think about how to open your doors for your customer, no matter what way they are getting to you. So is it, are you creating virtual programs? Are you creating curbside programs? Are you reaching out to foundations like us to say, how can I better serve your audience? Because mm -hmm. the able-bodied, we've figured that out for. Now let's think about the non-abled body and how can we serve them better? And it's a really good question for the community as a whole here because as I mentioned, a lot of businesses in New England are historic buildings, historic sites, and it's very limiting for people. So we really need to start thinking out of the box and start using, you know, virtual platforms or um, outdoor days that you can have and everything's, you know, set up in a parking lot, come together. But really, how can you cater to anyone at the time that they need it? Um, what programs do you have in place so that if somebody calls you and says, I can't actually get into your business, I can't get into your school, you can say, that's okay. I already have this in place, ready for you. It should just be a part of your business plan. It's, it's a phenomenal answer. And I think your work and the work that everyone's doing at Victoria Victory is part of that massive shifting mindset to accessibility first. Uh, so Susan, I just wanted to thank you so much for being um, on this conversation today, another episode of the Spotlight Sessions. And I really thank look you. forward to our next conversation and our next collaboration. I am so, and I, you know, I said this to you before we hit record, you guys are truly in the social change environment and you are making such an incredible difference and I can't thank you enough. And we are so thrilled to be partnered with you and to be aligned with your company because you're amazing. So thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. We are really grateful.